we wrap up our series on stewardship this week, uh, we've been through, started out with wisdom and what is wisdom compared to knowledge, the difference between knowledge and wisdom, knowledge being that which we can go to the library and read up on or get on the internet and look up, uh, that what we can acquire, what we can create. Uh, knowledge gives us wondrous uh, inventions and, and, and things that make life easier in so many ways. But it's not wisdom. Wisdom, by the, by, by the teachings of the Hebrew Bible, by our Bible, the, the teachings of wisdom, their source is God. They're a way of life. They're a way, of, way of, of reaching out and helping us with our knowledge and helping us with the reason of our mind, which is, is so remarkably powerful, but yet it can get so off track without the wisdom of God to guide us. And so many times we let our, our knowledge get ahead of us. We let our knowledge run amok, if we will. We let our knowledge become so self-centered that we lose track of where the wisdom of God is, is taking us. And what we're supposed to learn from God to really have that life, that true life, and, and, and to be part of God's creation, part of the creating act of, of redeeming this world. We get to be part of the soldiers in the field, if you will. We get to be part of the carpenters, the hands of Christ. What a blessing it is. But we have to know how to use this knowledge that we've acquired. In the book of James, and James, if you'll recall, the, son, uh, the half-brother of Jesus, he took over the Jerusalem church after Peter went to Rome uh, to help spread the gospel in Rome. And the book of James is very much it has a lot of wonderful Jewish wisdom to it. It's very much a Jewish writing. But James knows where he's at. He knows where he lives. He, know, he lives in a Greek and Roman world. And people that he wants to, to, come to come to know Yahweh, to come to know Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to come to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, he wants to speak their language. You know, when Paul went to uh, Athens, he tried to tell them about the the, he went to the Pantheon and, and, and tried to tell them about a God they didn't know about. They're trying to speak their language. And so when he starts out in this particular scripture, or the, or the writing that we have today, in the first part of James, and in 17, he says, Every generous act of giving, every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. We can understand that. We, we, that's part of our part of our heritage, part of how we understand the, the, the beauty of God. But it also speaks to the Greeks. It's a language that we really got from Greek philosophers. This idea that that uh, God is the one who who is way far above. Who doesn't venture down into, into the mess of this world? The people who were called Stoics. We've heard of being Stoic. And sometimes we look at Stoicism and we think, well, I'm going to be Stoic, you know. I'm not going to, I'm not going to cry or whimper or I'm going to be strong. And that's kind of the good part of the legacy of Stoicism. But it was a philosophy that was very powerful during the time of, time of Jesus. And afterwards, during the time of the New Te when the New Testament was being written. And the Stoics looked back to Plato. And so they're called Neoplatonists. But the Neoplatonists had an idea that God was way up here. And God created things. But then he let the different layers of heaven, as they went down and got further away from God, they became more corrupt more spoiled, and lesser gods were all about, and they, they might create, and this earth in us, we were made by a lesser god, one that really didn't know what he was doing, or really didn't care, uh, even the material, the earth itself, was just leftover material, how do you like being leftovers, yeah, well, we don't even think left, we'll put it in the pot and see what we get. Oh, see, it doesn't taste too good. That's kind of the philosophy of the, of the Stoics and the, and the Greek philosophers at the time. But 
they thought that if you could use knowledge, remember we're talking knowledge and not wisdom, but knowledge that you could learn to understand who God was. That reasoning, the, the ability of the mind, the human mind to reason uh, without emotion, uh, without love, without, without the, the, all those fuzzy, warm things that they thought interfered with, between us and God. In fact, since uh, men were the perfect Greek image of God, all right, ladies? Oh, I know, that was, that was a look. We're not that way anymore. It is. Fortunately, times have changed. But part of that philosophy was that the male figure was kind of the image of God. And, the, and women, well, women, y'all just didn't count as much in that first century. Because you're too busy doing things like loving, having emotion, uh, doing all that fuzzy, warm stuff. When a good stoic and one who really wanted to climb the ladder and get closer to God was interested in just the things of the mind, the things of reason, uh, blocking out the things of the heart, not really caring about the world around them because it didn't matter. It was made up of leftover coming material anyway. And so a stoic could, could ignore the misery of the world so long as he focused on his own separation. And so when they read about the light, and they talked about the light of God, they saw, yes, the one true light of God, which they got that part right. But they missed the boat when they were so more, so focused, so focused up there, that they let their own, their own shadows block out the light from them. That when they, when they, instead of moving towards the light, they focused on themselves, and they were actually moving away from that light of God. And James is just so, I think, so brilliantly written. He's caught their attention with this. And he's talking about the Lord of Light, which we know as, as Yahweh, as Jesus Christ. The Lord of Lights, all goodness comes from him. But it means so much more to us. Because we know this is not a leftover world. You may feel that way. And the way we go about living in this world, we may leave some leftovers of people. But we know this is, this, this is a, a beautiful, sacred place. The book of Genesis talk, starts out with the, with the Spirit of God hovering over and thinking and creating and putting, putting the divine hands in the mud and the dirt and molding the earth up, lovingly molding the earth and creating it out of, out of nothing God creates and, 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 and brings forth life on this earth because it matters. And he, and he brings forth man and woman and he breathes, his, he breathes the, the Spirit of life into us because we matter. Just that image of the loving God inside of us. That's why we met. But the Greeks didn't quite see it that way. But fortunately for us, James and the other early church fathers, they were listening to wisdom. They were listening to the wisdom of the Lord. They, were with, they understood that knowledge was important. They, they very much appreciated it. They were... As the, as the church grew, it became a place of, of study and intellect. But we always knew that the source of life and the source of goodness comes from God. But we get confused sometimes, too. I think we fall back. And one of the problems we have these days is that we forget our Christian and Jewish heritage and almost end up like ancient Greeks. We get so caught up in our own particular knowledge with our wisdom. We get so caught up in, in, in what we can create for ourselves and, and just trying to do religion somewhere up there that we forget that God has told us to do religion down here. We are people of the earth. Yes, we will go home. 
to a greater embrace of God. But if God is here now, and we are here now, and the kingdom of God, the Lord has said the kingdom of God is among you and with you and is growing it into the world, then this place matters. This world matters. You matter. I matter. We all matter. We matter enough that the incarnation of the living God literally came into our lives. 2,100 years ago, God did not stay up like some Greek God and look down on the earth and go, oh, look at all that inconsequential mess. The God who never left looked at us and said, I will love them to death and I will go to them and live out my wisdom among them. The difference between the wisdom and the knowledge is immense. And Wesley reminded us, he said, not only, do we, not only do we need the wisdom of God to guide us and to teach us and to show us, but we also need, we also need to be able to, to live in this world. So he gives us that wonderful, wonderful command, go out and make all you can. Make all you can. Isn't that a, isn't that a, isn't that a great way to get up in the morning? Who doesn't want to make all you can? And then he turns around and he says, not only do you make all you can, but enjoy your work, love your work. Make, see that your work actually brings you joy. And make sure that it, that it brings goodness to other people. The products that we, create, that we create, the products that we make, the service that we do, it has value. It has value. And if it doesn't, then reconsider what we're doing. Because life is short. And we're really, we've got so much to do. So much to do. And then he says, save all you can. And, and that, is, that is such great advice, but we have a hard time as Americans saving all we can. Um, and, uh, we all know we watch TV or, or whatever the form of advertisement is now. The best way to be a full human being is to have a, have a lot of credit in your wallet and to use it. And if, uh, after the new wears off, just go get some more. Do some more. Uh, I was talking to the, in the last service and talking about, uh, you know, we, we like new cars, we like new houses, we whatever it is that really strikes our fancy. And I do have a soft spot for Ford Mustangs. And... This is not a sponsored statement. <laughs> the new Mustang is sweet looking. I no. know all the Chevy guys in the house are going, oh, yeah, right, you know. And, and everybody was from, huh? Camaro. Camaro, yeah, yeah, the Camaro, Camaro guy, yeah. But um, now we're just trying to even be in the same league with the Germans and Japanese. and. But anyway, I got a soft spot for a Mustang. But I've also reached a point in age where I should never get behind the wheel <laughs> of a high powered automobile again. The reactions just aren't quite there. We all got something that's calling to us, that turns our neck when we're driving down the road, that makes us stop and to look and to wish and, and to want and to forget. The real joy is going to come from the wisdom of living in God. Living in Jesus Christ, living by the power of that Holy Spirit that is inside of us and guiding us. And yes, we are called to make all that we can. And we are called to save all that we can. But then we're, we're in danger at the same time to fall in love with our own treasures. And, and it, it goes throughout the entire the, the Hebrew text, text the, the Old Testament he goes throughout the New Testament. Our possessions can bring us great joy, they can bring us comfort, and they can destroy us. I guess it's part of the human nature. The only thing that we have to really grab a hold of is God. Everything else 
God in love. Now let's go ahead and finish up that statement from Jesus. God, love, and neighbor. Everything else is dust in the wind. And it will be dust in the wind. We are called to make all that we can, save all we can. And the way that we save ourselves is to go into Scripture. To go into Scripture, not just to read. Because we can read the Word of God and put it up and forget it in three seconds or less. And in fact, if I've got something else going on in my head, I can read and not even know what I read one second left. I mean, in the middle of it, I wonder what I read. But if we, if we invite someone with us, that someone being the Holy Spirit of the living God, who is quite real and quite active and is part of who we are, if we invite the Spirit of God into the written Word of God, the Word can teach and lead us with the wisdom of God by the grace of God. That grace of God that was working, before, working on us before we were even born, that providing grace that, that was calling us and calling, us our, calling the people in our past and building the churches up, building this church up before any of us were ever even here, the providing grace that, that that, that called us and, and, and Christ who, who, who gave himself for us and brought us here and then woke us up to where we, we realized, oh my, I need God. We were justified. Some people call it saved. We, we, we entered into a relationship with the God who's been walking with us talking to us our entire life. But we finally wake up, we see, we see what we need, we see who we are, and we realize, I need God. And we wake up, and we enter into our relationship with God. Now the Stoics, they wouldn't appreciate that relationship. Unless they meant going off into the desert and, and, and voiding, the, you know, making sure that everybody else was away from them and, and, and having no passions and having no love. Well, our God is a God of love. Our God is the one who got down and, and, and made creation with the divine hands, who got dirty in creation, who walked, who walked with the ancients, who walked with Moses, who, who walked with the children of Israel, who wept with them and fought with them. The one, the one who was incarnated as Christ Jesus came and bled with us. Oh, the cynics must have had a good time with that. But that's our God. That is who we have come to worship. And the incarnation of God did not stop with when Jesus was res resurrected and when he ascended. The incarnation was passed on to the church by the power of the Holy Spirit. We are here as a people and a church and as a congregation with a purpose. A fantastic purpose. The greatest purpose that we could ever aspire to live up to. If you were ever climbing a corporate ladder or, or developing a company within, within, within your own means and, and you had great aspirations, it could not be any greater than what God has called us to do in his own church. It doesn't get any bigger than God. It doesn't get any greater than salvation. And salvation is a living part of us. It's never just a lone thing that happened when I was 12 years old. It's who we are. And we always are moving forward. I think in the image of the Greeks and the light, they were moving away from the light and they were casting the shadows and, they, and there was too much darkness around them to really see where they were going. But Christ has little light and has called us to go towards it, to go to look into the sun that is Jesus Christ and to be drawn to it and to be warmed by it, to be comforted by it and to be changed by it. And if we have to, like a moth to a flame, be burned up by it because it is God is calling. God is calling in his churches. There is work to be done. But we are moving forward. We are a people of Christ. But there is work to be done. There was a, a poet, you know, I was reading her work this past week, and I cannot recall her name, and I apologize. 
but she, she wrote this wonderful poem about Mary. And it, and it was and it apparently was written to be right after the birth of Jesus, and she's holding Jesus, and she's thinking back, and, and she's thinking of the, you know, the angel came and told her about the incarnation that was going to happen within her. And, and she imagined as she traveled those nine months and over, and over the, 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 the miles of, of Judean wilderness to get to Bethlehem, and she imagined within her is, is the creator of the stars above her at night when she lays down, and she looks out and she sees the world, she sees the dust, she sees the dirt, she sees the goodness, she sees the people, she sees the need, and she knows who is in within inside of her, and she's thinking, this is incredible. What you? And then she has the baby. And while she's had, as she has the baby, these visitors are coming, as, as we read, as we read in, the, in, the, in the Christmas stories. And she says to herself, they, they look and they stare at my child as if he's going to start throwing out gold coins. They're looking at what he's going to do for them. She says, I look at my child, and I see his little pink knuckles, and I see his little fingers. I say to myself, what more miracle could I possibly ask for? See, God came to humanity. God thought so much of you and me and everyone else that God joined with our humanity for one time. And God took that part of him home. God thought so much of this world, not like some Greek God way up there that just doesn't care, and then we're going to work our way back up there somehow out of our intellect and our reason, but out of the passion and the love of Jesus Christ. And that is our calling. That, that, that is why we are called to, to give something of ourselves, because it matters. It matters greatly. And that matters to the kids club where children are brought in. And, and yes, a lot of those children will never come to our church. You know, we, yeah, we want them to come. We want them to bring their parents. We want them to fit. But they're getting a taste of Christ. And what a beautiful, wonderful taste of Christ it is. For a year and a half, we begged, begged God for a, for, a, for a youth director. And now, now we've, we've got one. I tried, Trace and I tried to keep up with him yesterday. <laughs> Got home at 11.30 last night. Boy, dead of the world. <laughs> that filled. Because we spent time with God's children. And the rides were fun, too. We have been called not to move backwards, but to move forward. We have been called because we matter and the people around us now our heart matter. We have been called because the people in this world matter and God cares. We have been called to move forward. We have been called to give something of ourselves like Christ did. And yes, we do need the finances. That's part of living in a capitalist society. We don't want the government running our church. And if we don't want the government running our church, then we got to run it ourselves. We got to pay our own way. But it also, we're the ones who have been called to be the hands and the feet of Christ in the missions that hand out the food, that gather the food together, that help the people in need. We are being part of Christ on earth, the incarnation. Now look around. Your brothers and sisters are around you. There's also a whole lot missing. These pews are calling out for an invitation that can only come from the people. There is someone in our lives who needs to be right there. Now some are sick. Some can't come anymore. But some have never been through that door or it's been decades. But there's someone in our lives, I, I, I would have a hard time accepting that there's not someone in our lives that needs to be right there. We're moving forward. Christ is calling. 